Okay. That's better. Yeah, I think someone's mic was on. All right, excellent. Thanks, guys. Um, anyway, Dr. Diane is um, is an internationally recognized surgeon in in many aspects of of cancer reconstruction, but particularly lymphedema. And I had the a pleasure of visiting Joe and um, and the rest of our colleagues at Sloan Kettering uh, last May. It's almost exactly a year ago. I believe it was May seventh, which was a Tuesday. Um, and um, I had a great time uh, spending time with everyone there. Um, and I spent an entire day on on, on the Tuesday with. Uh, with Joe in the OR, where he uh, performed uh, three omentum flaps actually for lymph lymphedema, and he split one into two. So I got to see actually four omentum flaps in one day, which was fantastic. Um, and I was really just impressed with with his care and and his thought process in uh, the treatment of lymphedema. And so that's why I thought he would be a, a perfect person um, to invite to um, to give us um, a talk today on the Sloan Kettering approach, if you will, uh, toward the the treatment of lymphedema. Um, he, uh, they, they basically started back up with COVID, so I really appreciate uh, Joe taking the time out of his very busy schedule uh, to join us today. So with that, I, I want to turn it over to you, Joe. Um, I, I'm going to give you control of the um, uh, screen here to you make your presenter. You should be able to the screen down below and share your screen with us. Um, looking for it. Sorry. No worries. Um, There's a button down below that says screen if you press that. Got it. And I'm going to ask everyone to please mute your microphones um, and you can turn your cameras off as well so that we can only focus on the talk and Dr. Diane. Joe, you can keep your mic on. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, I can definitely hear you. Okay, thank you so thank you so much, Bobic and Greg, for the for the uh, invitation and the kind introduction. It's really it's truly an honor to present to you. I'm um, this is really a, a lot of what I'm presenting has been over the years collaborations with various people and um, drawing from a lot of co you know a lot of colleagues and. Um, fellows and and uh, mentors so uh, lymphedema for me is really a personal journey but also very much a communal one um, this is a um, this is just a photo that was this is a an actual anatomic drawing that was <clears throat> done in over 100 years ago um, and it's amazing because back then they weren't doing anything they didn't know what a lymph node transplant was or had any concept of that but um, right here, you actually are looking the anatomic basis for a thoracodorsal artery-based lymph node transplant, as well as a lateral thoracic artery-based lymph node transplant. You can actually see those vessels uh, going right into the lymph nodes as they were. And I really have this sense that right now, things are staring me right in the face that I just don't see. And hopefully less than 100 years from now, people will pick it up. So lymphedema is an amazing... Um, uh, uh, place to go to if you're if you're interested in the unknown, and if you want to make a, a big impact. Um, and we need a lot of we need more smarter and more people in this field. My disclosures: I'm a paid consultant for Stryker, um, mainly interested in the development of the technology to see lymphatics. I will be discussing the use of ICG lymphangiography, which is off-label. Um, part of part of our bottlenecks in uh, surgery, particularly lymphedema, is the is the technology. So I have a special interest in in the future and future technology. And I own a minority share of non-related startup. I do. I I have a soft spot for patients who fall through the cracks. Um, I took care of my grandmother with who died from uh, problems related to advanced Parkinson's disease, an unrelenting, just brutal uh, disease for which there's only really one drug and not much more. And so. So these patients, this was a patient with metastatic melanoma, it's the brain, just so that I'm not, I I usually get uh, pigeonholed for lymphedema, but I'm really interested in anything like on the frontier, but we, she had been paralyzed for a year and a half and we were able to get her face back uh, with a couple nerve transfers, but nobody would touch her. And similarly, patients with lymphedema, um, when I was training, nobody, it wasn't really a surgical problem. You send them to the lymphedema therapist 
And uh, it's a very unfortunate disease. I had no idea about the lymphatic system really at all, other than cancer invaded it. Um, I now um, um, think about this uh, or the rehabilitation of the upper or lower extremity more than just lymphedema goal. Um, this is a mastectomy. You used to just see it as a defect. Now I see nerves that are clipped, bovy, burnt, uh, stretched, you know, these patients have pain and patients, patients don't all complain about the full extent of what they experience because they're grateful that their life was saved, but they tolerate a lot. And so, you know, axillary pain, range of motion issues are major issues, not just the lymphedema. So um, these, are, these are kind of insights. And of course, I've done neurotization or have uh, treated these nerves as you would prophylactically to prevent a neuroma. Um, but this is this is really state of the art for lymphedema um, in most centers in 2020, sorry. Um, this is an older slide I imported, but this is basically it. The standard of care right now is to wait until somebody is complaining of swelling, they'll go to this doctor and hopefully the doctor will recognize it's lymphedema then send them to the lymphedema therapist. And then they get this for the rest of their life. And even if they do everything perfect, it may still get worse. They may get life-threatening infections. They may lose their job. Um, this is pretty. This is pretty way behind every other disease process. And lymphedema is common. Um, I've heard many oncologic surgeons say that they don't see lymphedema anymore. But plastic surgeons follow up um, with the patients. I would say, um, in a, in a, on a quality of life level. So I think we see. We see we may see a bit more. Um, that's not, that's a, that's a generalization. It's not always true, but I think that um, the patients are usually complaining to us about their quality of life, and we're on the front line in, to some degree. Um, lymphedema happens in one, about one in three patients with an axillary dissection and radiation, um, and one in six patients with solid organ tumors. It's more common than uh, complication than uh, complications related to radiotherapy, chemotherapy. Um, on a scale of other diseases, it's up there with Alzheimer's. It's more common than ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, MS, ALS, and Parkinson's put together. So, um, so this is a big public health problem, but it's been sitting in the closet for a long time. Um, it is changing, though. There are most patients, most people in the, on the street have never heard of lymphedema, but this was a patient of mine. Well, fortunately, we had a good result with her lymph node transplant. She's, she's had six infections preoperatively, three of which would cause sepsis. Um, she's now three years out and has not had any infections. She's a prosecutor in Kentucky. But but the, one of the questions is like, why, why is that? Um, and I think a large reason is because MDs have largely been excluded from the lymphedema, or if not really included themselves in the world of lymphedema because it was never considered uh, sort of a medical disease. You, you, you get therapy for lymphedema and therapists only have certain tools. Um, we rely on them heavily. They've shouldered the burden. Um, they're, I, my closest relationships are with my lymphedema therapists outside of my immediate team. But um, the only tools you have are compression and massage. And you're not going to arrive at a cure or advance the actual solution to the core problem. And um, if you look at lymphedema related to something like breast cancer, before the 60, late 60s, when the mammogram was invented, if you couldn't see or feel uh, a breast mass, you basically didn't have cancer as far as you knew. And imaging dramatically improved this because through early detection, we know that basically if you spot cancer early enough is essentially curable. And, and so survival rates went way up when you can see beyond your five senses. Um, and then, and then it goes, then we go deeper. Now we, ha we really know the, the behavior and tumor biology and we can target them. But, but if you look at lymphedema, I'm sorry, this is, these were slides I imported that I, I had updated this last night. And then for some reason, my cloud is not working. Um, but if you don't see a big arm or a big leg, basically nobody thinks that that person has lymphedema. It, it just doesn't exist, including most doctors, including me before I really got into this and actually including me up until maybe five years ago. 
And then, then if you look at the staging system, they're based solely on physical exam. So um, swelling is actually, as I've discovered, a very late sign of the disease. The damage to the lymphatic system happens before you see any swelling. We don't really rely on our five senses to detect breast cancer um, anymore. Uh, lymphedema can be seen as like a heart attack of the lymphatic system. So, so just because somebody hasn't had a heart attack or doesn't have angina, it doesn't mean they don't have cardiovascular disease. Similarly, just because you don't see a big arm, it doesn't mean that the lymphatic system is diseased and uh, just needs one little thing to tip it over. Um, so, so this is where um, vascularized lymph node transplant, which was my first exposure to lymphedema or lymphatic surgery came in. The idea is that it replaces an immunologic organ, um, conceptually different from a bypass, which is a purely mechanical uh, solution. There are growth factors, which we've identified, which have been identified by Carrie Alitalo, specifically VEGFC, that stimulate lymphangiogenesis and growth of lymphatics into those nodes. Um, there is distal lymph lymphovenous bypass, popularized by Koshima. Um, essentially using supermicrosurgery to, to bypass these obstructions. And then there's more proximal lymphovenous bypass popularized by Campisi. Uh, this is one I did using immediate lymphatic reconstruction at the time of the uh, um, axillary dissection where I've telescoped lymphatics into a branch off the axillary vein and you can see the flow, the green dyes from the lymphatic system going into the vein. Um, and and my, my first exposure at all um, was when I went to my fellowship at Changgung in Taiwan. Mingwei Cheng had done about five lymph node transplants at that time. And when I was there, we did another four or five. And this was the marking uh, for the first patient I saw. And I had no clue, like I had no clue exactly where the groin nodes were. I knew they were in the groin, but um, it's kind of like if I asked you what what does the penny, you, you know what a penny looks like, but can you describe which way is Lincoln facing? Is the, what what is written on the bottom? What is written on the top? Exactly, like where are these lymph nodes, where do they exist in relation to the inguinal ligament, to the groin crease, to certain structures? Like I had no idea, only that they were generally in this groin, but, but you'll see how this is uh, very critical. Um, at that time, there were two, publications on lymph node transplant, and one of them was on a dog. There were no published reports of donor site lymphedema. Uh, people who were doing lymph node transplant, there were only a handful, there was one mainly in France, were saying, you no, know, there was really no, no donor site lymphedema, and we do skip flaps, and there's been no lymphedema from them, but this was all the state of the union back then. If you looked in the literature, there was no way to figure out how to do this operation. There was no description. And I personally didn't know basic lymphatic anatomy at all or physiology. Like I didn't know that the lymphatic system had valves. I didn't know really the whole structure of it. Um, it's not something we really focused on. Um, and then there's more, there's more to swelling than just the lymphatic system. So, so the whole framework and and you want a framework with, for those of you going out and doing this. When the patient comes into your office, you know, many times when I started, I, I like I didn't know what my physical exam should be. I didn't know what to order. I didn't know what I'm looking for. I'm just trying to figure it out. So this is a framework um, that I've come to over the years. And I first look at, ask myself four questions. One is, what's the condition of the lymphatic system itself? Two how much of this is fat and how much of this is fluid. Um, there is a peculiar phenomenon present in most patients. In fact, we've done a study, 80 to 90% of patients with lymphedema have some degree of fat hypertrophy. So there's this interaction that happens and that may change what type of surgery you might consider. And then what's happening to the veins? What's the status of the, the veins? Um, this was under under recognized early on in lymphedema. It's still under recognized, but I think we're doing better, particularly in the lower extremity. Most of us have have some form of venous insufficiency. Um, it's such a common problem in the population, so that does have to be looked at. And then finally, rarely but definitely happens is cancer recurrence. I've picked up 
over the past um, 10 years for incidental cancers by doing the preoperative imaging workup. You definitely don't want to be caught by surprise. Um, it's hard to do, but collecting data is really important in this field. Um, I didn't even know how to collect data or what I was collecting. I didn't even know the questions I was asking. Now these things have kind of come into focus. So every case we do is, is on a prospective controlled study. We have a control group of non-surgical patients that we follow the same way as our surgical patients. Um, and we're actually going through our preliminary data after 110 some odd patients with at least a year follow-up uh, right now. Um, but going to the physical exam, um, there are some things that are telltale signs of venous compression. So if you see venous collaterals like this on a mastectomy, she may well have axillary vein compression. If somebody has varicosities, if somebody's had vein surgery in the legs, these are all things that um, kind of put up a red flag to me. The status of the lymphatic system, I really rely on ICG and lymphocentigraphy. ICG tells me the status of the superficial lymphatic system. You can only see about a centimeter deep to the skin, so it's an incomplete, but a very high resolution image. Um, in this case, uh, this patient, big arm, you see this uh, reticular stardust type pattern. No, no surprise here, she has no, there are no visible lymphatics. Uh, somebody like this is not gonna be a good candidate for lymphovenous bypass, because you need something to bypass too. Um, so I actually do ICG in the office, uh, two injections with lidocaine is virtually painless. And it really helps me tell the patient, first of all, is what, what type of surgery am I going to do? And they're interested to know what their lymphatic system is. More interestingly though, is this is a patient where there's no visible swelling, but she's having symptoms. And you can see on ICG, she has a fairly advanced disease, although she does have a lymphatic a vessel that's visible and therefore bypassable. When you see a linear lymphatic, usually what you see in the operating room is a... Um, oh, um, I think uh, somebody... Uh, please mute your microphone, whoever that is. Um, so Hello? once you see a, once you see a lymphatic, um, on ICG, pretty consistently, if you go in the operating room and you make a skin incision, you're going to see a healthy translucent lymphatic that's actively pumping something and not a scarred down wisp of nothing that's not doing anything. Um, so this helps me go in knowing that I'm going to do an operation that may work. Um, but you can see her disease is more advanced than what you might expect. And so um, just like somebody can have pretty extensive calcification of their coronaries and atherosclerosis, but no angina yet, you know, this is not, this is not good. She's been wrapping and she has flare-ups, but um, if you use limb volume to measure your outcome after surgery, you're not going to really measure anything. And measuring whether something worked in lymphedema, as you can tell by this patient, becomes very, very difficult. Uh, we don't have a test to measure lymphatic transport reproducibly, um, so we go on patient quality of life. Um, I've worked hard to standardize this. You know, how long after the injection do you take your picture? You have to compare these amongst each other in the same way. Um, you can see we see a radial and ulnar bundle of lymphatics. These are pretty consistent across most patients. Um, Sometimes one is fairly dominant. These are all physiologic um, observations that may be important. The punchline is I just need two injections, one in the first and third web space in the hand, and 30 minutes. Um, I take an early picture at five minutes to see if there are any lymphatics I can bypass. And at 30 minutes, I take a picture for staging purposes. The, um, the other main imaging uh, procedure I do is uh, MRA. And MRA you need because, I don't know what's wrong with my slide. I've been having some technical issues. What the slide on the left was showing is another patient with another leg that's just about the same size. 
but you can see uh, one leg is fluid dominant, the other leg is fat dominant, black is fluid, white is fat on these um, on this series. Um, and, and these two patients are not gonna respond the same, presumably to a lymph node transplant or a bypass or liposuction or a medical intervention if you're testing a drug. Um, both of these currently are considered the same lymphedema stage, but they are not the same. And this is one of the most major confounding factors. We just published this in PRS in February that is not considered in any uh, study of any lymphatic intervention. You'll never find people stratified to fluid or fat dominance. That makes you know, drug discovery, surgery development very difficult if we're not even, we don't know if we're operating on the same patients. And this just shows there's a wide variety of fluid and fat composition in patients at the same clinical stage. So clinical staging is really, from a surgeon's standpoint, not really useful. Um, so why, why is this? Like, why do we see this fat growing in the limb? And the answer is really the immune system. There's definitely a progressive and proliferative process. Um, a lot of this, this basic science work was pioneered by my colleague, Dr. Bobic Marara, the other Bobic. Um, and uh, he thinks of this as diseases like pulmonary fibrosis, cirrhosis of the liver and so forth, where you actually have a progressive um, disease and, and you get fat growth, scar deposition, and so forth. Uh, these are things we're investigating but are beyond the scope of this talk. Um, but we have tested and are looking at drugs uh, specifically targeting um, the pathways that lead to fat growth and lymphatic scarring. The other thing that the MR, MRA shows you is, is vein compression. So I get the MRA for tissue composition, cancer, uh, cult cancer, and vein compression. And if you see vein compression, you probably need to treat it. We always treat it. Uh, this is a fully decompressed axillary vein. In the radiated patients, these can be heavily scarred and can be uh, tricky. Um, the final thing I get is lymphocentigraphy. So lymphocentigraphy gives me a baseline so that if I did, for example, lymph node transplant to the axilla, if she has no uptake pre-op, and then she has uptake post-op, you know, I know that, that, that those nodes are physiologically active. Um, it also lets me know pre-op if there is any uptake in the axilla. I'm not gonna do a radical exoneration of scar in the axilla because I might actually make her worse. Um, this is, a, this is a, a validated patient reported outcome. Uh, this is the ULL27. It is a commonly used um, patient reported outcome for lymphedema. Um, the problem though is, so for that patient with early lymphedema who has symptoms, has had cellulitis, is wrapping all the time, but has no limb volume difference, how do you measure your outcome? Um, it's really the only way is patient reported outcome at this point. The problem is, is that her main complaint is wrapping all the time and all the time burden and effort she, she does to keep her limb controlled. The patient reported outcomes that exist today were mainly developed by lymphedema therapists. So you'll see um, what's absent here, I'll just tell you, is that it doesn't have any, any quality of life measure related to the actual treatment itself because lymphedema therapists are using the treatments. So. Um, you know, from a surgical perspective, we're going to have our skew and bias. From a lymphedema therapist perspective, there are going to be a skew and bias. But, but there is a big hole um, in measuring the, the burden of the treatment itself. And we find that about a third of all of our patients barely use or don't use at all compression. Um, sometimes the treatment is just as hard as the disease or worse. Um, the referral source is just, you know, a lot of this actually doesn't come most of these patients are coming from the oncologic surgeon or they're self-referred. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to waste too much time in, in demographics. Um, but we looked at recently and published in, um, one of the journals, um, all of these sort of factors. Lymphocentigraphy is not a particularly sensitive, uh, um, test for lymphedema. Um, We've seen ICG be become much more sensitive, although it's not a validated test for, for diagnosing lymphedema, so we can't really say. We did find the LDEX or bioimpedance basically measures the electrical resistance across a limb. 
the more water in the limb, the more fluid in the limb, the less the resistance, the, the worse the lymphedema, presumably. Um, and so there, this does actually correlate with limb volume quite well. So we use bioimpedance routinely in addition to limb volume. Um, a lot of pain and anxiety are common. About a third of patients have infections. Interestingly, but not surprisingly, the patient's disability or patient-reported outcome does not really correlate with the limb volume size. So patients with mild limb volume difference can have a pretty bad quality of life because of the wrapping, because of infections, and because of fear of future progression. They avoid many activities they love to do. They don't golf, they don't garden, they don't go to the beach because they're worried about a flare-up. So, um, so my, my startup into lymph node transplant was basically at a time where there was no ICG or understanding instruments, suture materials, scopes. These were all like not really that great. And so my early experience with lymphovenous bypass was failure. And then I, I moved toward lymph node transplant. Now I do both. I do a lot of lymphovenous bypass, a lot of lymph node transplant and liposuction when indicated. And there are many places to get these from the neck, from the groin, from the armpit, from below the, the chin. I'll, I'll explain um, where I started was from the groin because that was the first case I ever saw. Um, and and this, was, this was scary because I was worried about creating lymphedema. Um, so we, we had published on reverse lymphatic mapping. But basically the idea um, I read um, in the 70s by Holtborn, the Swedish uh, breast surgeon who was injecting different tracers back then. Um, nothing really came of it. There was no such thing as lymph node transplant, but basically borrowed that concept and injected ICG into the trunk to find the lymph nodes that I wanted to take that are draining the trunk and inject technetium into the foot to identify lymph nodes draining the lower limb, which obviously we're going to leave alone. And basically we can see in the operating room which lymph nodes are safe to take. And Pat found some consistent findings. We published this. Are the target lymph nodes are always above the groin crease and at or below the inguinal ligament and lateral uh, to the SIED. As, so, so why is this important is because, you know, where I asked like where, asked myself, where are the lymph nodes exactly? The lymph nodes that we were taking in Taiwan were actually below the groin crease. And using the technetium, I found out consistently were the sentinel nodes draining the lower limb. So you can see um, this is um, Mingwei's um, um, diagram in the upper right corner showing the, the note target nodes below the crease. Now our target nodes should always be above the crease. So um, knowing exactly where you are um, and having this uh, information and data to guide you is very, very critical because sure enough, as time went on, there were reports of donor site lymphedema, which is totally devastating um, and essentially makes the operation like um, borderline undoable if, you're, if you can't see what you're doing. Um, I'm not gonna go into the specific technique because I've since abandoned this pretty much, although I don't think it's wrong to do. I think you do have to be careful. This is a case where sometimes the node draining the trunk is, shares drainage to the lower limb and so I boarded this case. Here you have the sentinel node to the leg. And that's the node draining our trunk, which also is very hot. So in this case, I just abandoned, I just aborted, put a drain and closed and went to a different site. And the rate of that is about 5.6%. It was 5.6% in our series. So it kind of makes me nervous. Axillary lymph node transplant, there's much more separation between nodes that drain the trunk and drain the axilla, although psychologically people are skittish about taking nodes in the axilla, and technically there's a bigger learning curve. The good thing about the axilla is if you need a lot of tissue, a lot of skin, it's got oodles. Um, same thing here, um, and you can, you can do this pretty safely. Here your nice glistening nodal fat. Um, and um, I think my volume's not on. Here, I always document a 10 second count, the central node of the extremity.
and then I'll and then a second 10 second count of the flap just so you see you know I'm not there's no essentially no uptake in the flap sometimes there's a little if you do this you have to keep switching back with the gamma probe the whole case but if you do this right you can safely harvest nodes it's just what I want you to see this was placed in the medial sural vessels in the calf um, and this is a uptake in the calf post-op and we always evaluate the donor site one year post-op and beyond uh, where we took the nodes. So far we haven't seen um, donor site lymphedema um, but I'm always worried about it and and you can see on the groin I'm sorry on the groin BGLNT is the groin the blue shows you the uptake in the harvested nodes which is the highest amount of uptake of all the other uh, nodes. It's still just about, um, I think about 5% uptake of the sentinel node, but it still makes me nervous. Um, and I, I think supraclavicular became popular as well. David Chang does a lot of these and does them really well. Um, he uses a limited incision. Um, some people, about 15%, do have supraclavicular node drainage preoperatively. I don't know if that's significant or not. Um, you can get a chyle leak, which is a pain in the neck. Um, I have had one complication where I just had to, the, the main lymphatic ducts are draining into those supraclavicular nodes sometimes. And, and then I, I basically didn't want a leak, so I uh, avoided that complication by doing a bunch of lymphovenous bypasses with these huge lymphatics. So it is a technically uh, delicate procedure. And then, and then basically, basically now I do gastroepiploic nodes or the omentum, which has gastroepiploic nodes. Um, this, is, this is a flap that has evolved in my hands. So it's, I'm sh what I'm showing here is the venous hypertension releasing a clip off the distal vein. So I have the artery and vein fired up. And this is the distal gastroepiploic vein, which you can see sometimes is high pressure like an artery. And you do not want venous hypertension in your lymph node flap because then there's no gradient for lymph to uh, exit into the venous system. And so now um, we published this, I think, a year or two ago. Now I always hook up the distal vein. So there's a venous loop, one artery and two veins. And that's really the natural physiology of the flap. The flap has two entrances and two exits. Because it's just a solid pipe that irrigates tangentially to the pipe, if you just close off the other end of the pipe, you're going to hold a bunch of blood slamming into the rest of your flap. Um, so this was just, um, this is just showing that you get actually antegrade flow both through the distal and um, proximal gastroepiploic veins. Um, I also test for venous back bleeding. Venous back bleeding is usually thought of as something you test for lymphovenous bypass. If you have a lot of back pressure from the vein, you um, might not have a successful bypass, but that, that, that may hold true for lymph node transplant as well. And here, there's no clip on this vein. So there's no, there's no back bleeding and, and that's a good sign. If there's a recipient selection be decision between two veins, um, I'll take the one with no back bleeding. And you can see there's no back bleeding. These are other other things that I've observed. So this is very fibrous tissue. I mean, this leg has a lot of fat and scar hypertrophy. So I'll, I'll just cut all of this out and then replace it with a nice supple, uh, large surface area omentum in these more advanced cases. In cases where the lymphatic system's totally shot, I'll do a double omentum with Bob, which Bobic saw where we'll take one part, put in the forearm or wrist, second part, put in the axilla. I bury all these flaps. I don't leave an unsightly thing. And you can see on one year post-op by CG, the lymph nodes light after injection into the hands. Um, complications from the omentum out of 152, we've had two flap losses, one due to a highly radiated patient who had a necrotizing infection post-op day 10, ate up the flap. The other was just an out and out flap loss. Two patients with ileus beyond uh, 24 hours, which required placing an NG tube. Um, I now use Entereg and since have not needed the NG tube. I, have never, I don't put NG tubes routinely at all. Um, my very 
probably my third case. I got uh, mild transient pancreatitis, very scary. Um, I All the big chunky nodes are right by the pancreas and I got a little too greedy. Um, didn't directly injure the pancreas, but uh, pissed it off. So I'm much more conservative. And one patient with a small hernia requiring repair. I now do, all, I do all the abdominal closures now myself. The, the people close the abdominal wall in different ways. Um, I think that's very, that's a very critical thing. Um, this was the first patient I ever did. Um, this was in her words after a lymph node transplant. Um, I don't know if you can hear. Yeah, the uh, the computer audio unfortunately is not playing. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I mean, basically, sorry. basically, she's saying she can finally feel her wrist and finally feel her elbow, and I got totally lucky. Um, I didn't. I I got totally lucky on this on my first case because I really didn't know what I was doing. The indications back then were like, if you have a big arm or a big leg, do a lymph node transplant and hope for the best. You know now. Now a lot of these things come in into focus. Um, I got lucky with her; she did well. And this was—I don't know what's wrong with my. There's something funky because I have her nine-year post-op result. But anyway, in her case, it worked. Um, oh, these are just—I'm sorry. This was a case of mild, mild uh, lymphedema. Um, but basically, you can see the hand and forearm are a little better. Again, these all these pictures I hate because they're half-baked. Uh, the big confounding factor is, are they getting more compression and more physiotherapy afterward? But everybody wants to see before and after photos for what they're worth. I don't think they're worth all that much. Um, I only put this up here to say that in some patients, I don't know why, but it will take uh, a year or two for the lymph node transplant to work. Some have a very early response, some have no response, some have a delayed response, and some even get worse. Um, in patients that have combined lymphatic problem and a fat hypertrophy problem, you can see your ICG looks pretty bad. Um, I did a lymph node transplant um, on her, and, and, and then a year later, liposuction to suck out all the excess fat. So you might say, well, this is all, this benefit is all from the liposuction, but I would point your attention to her hand, which preoperatively is swollen and postoperatively looks pretty normal. Um, that's not the liposuction because the liposuction, there's no real fat that you suck out of the hand. The liposuction is really limited to above the wrist to the axilla. Um, so I do believe a lymph node transplant had some benefit, you know, distal to the area of the lipo. Um, liposuction is only indicated for patients who are in compression around the clock and, and do not have pitting edema because the fluid liposuction is not going to treat the fluid and if they're not compliant with compression, it's going to come back. Hakan Borson has published extensively on that. You, this is a severe case, just multiple axillary squamous cells, flaps, multiple radiation, basically can't move his shoulder, um, open wounds, um, and this is in the OR just literally incised this wound. This isn't scar excision, this is scar incision. You can see his axillary vein is hanging out there, not in continuity, his brachial plexus is bowstring. You can't really stretch this because you're gonna cause trauma to the plexus. So this was a greater saphenous vein graft and a latissimus flap with vascularized lymph nodes. This I did with Mark Smith back when I was at Beth Israel. Um, and use the saphenous vein graft and a branch off of it as the venous recipient vessel for the flap. You can see it flowing, flowing there. It's just about seven years ago. And then you can see it flowing into the, ax the reconstructed axillary vein. And this is, uh, he was in therapy preoperatively, but they couldn't get any fluid out. And this is post-op with therapy. Um, these are lower extremity lymphedema, um, a year post-op. Again, she does have fat hypertrophy, but you can see the fluid reduction on MRA post-op, and you can also see uptake in the lymph nodes that we transplanted to the calf one year later. 
Now I'm doing prophylactic omentum. So patients who are like definitely going to get lymphedema and they're going to blast them with radiation. This was a sort of self-controlled patient, patient with a, a vulvar squamous cell, very young. Uh, GYN surgeon said she's definitely going to get lymphedema. She got high ra dose radiation to both nodal basins. Um, and I did an omentum at the time of the uh, lymphadenectomy. Um, eight months later, you can see lymphocentigraphy. There's continuity across the lymph node transplant that goes all the way up. These two sides look similar. She unfortunately developed a recurrence in the contralateral groin. They just did a lymphadenectomy. Uh, they didn't really call me. We, so there was no lymphatic procedure on that side. And you can see on the right side, she had lymphadenectomy without nodes. On the left side, she had lymphadenectomy with nodes, and the right side blew up immediately. This is totally unscientific. It's just a single case, of course, but it definitely piqued my interest in, you know, if somebody was going to take out all my axillary lymph nodes and I need my arm for surgery, would I rather somebody just stick a piece of omentum in there? Um, is there any benefit to that? Um, and I, I really do think so because um, now I'm looking at, axil at the axilla as not just lymphatic reconstruction, but axillary reconstructions, the soft tissue defect is quite significant. And you have all these cut nerves that never get reconstructed. You know, why not? Patients are really bothered by it. Um, and then you radiate that and you have these raw nerves that are clipped and bovied. And then this thin piece of skin with pain organs uh, in it that then get radiated and plastered onto these nerves. You can get a, uh, a range of motion issue. Um, and pain, these are not, not insignificant things and they're fairly common. So um, I think reconstructing the axilla, you might as well throw some lymphatic tissue and it is reasonable. For um, indications for surgery, we, I don't operate on anybody with a BMI over 30 because I want a fairly homogeneous patient population so I can answer the simple question, is what I'm doing, does it actually work? I still don't know that because to answer that, you need a prospective study with a control group and you need follow-up at least two years. So we, we're having preliminary data. Um, I can tell you that there are definitely patients that benefit. There are definitely patients that absolutely have no response. And there are definitely a handful of patients that get worse. So this is a very high stakes, very stressful uh, conversation with the patient, a very sober and open conversation with the patient. Um, I think future cure for lymphedema will be a combination of surgery and medicine because the surgery doesn't necessarily reverse the underlying immunologic process, just like fixing a diabetic foot uh, wound is not going to cure the diabetes. I, we don't really understand this disease in its totality um, <clears throat> to know the effect of what we're doing. So it's a very um, messy, difficult um, uh, area. Hey, Joe, are you still there? Joe, can you hear us? We seem to we seem to have lost Joe, uh, unfortunately. Um, he may try to log on, so let's uh, let's give him a minute, <clears throat> um, and uh, and we'll. Oh, he's calling me right now. Hold on one second. Hey, Joe, how are you? No worries. It looks like you, it says you're offline. So why, why don't you go ahead and rejoin? I'm going to actually um, dismiss the this version of Joe Diane and you can just rejoin us, okay? Okay, cool. No worries. Thanks. All right, everyone. Uh, Dr. Diane will be back in just a couple minutes. He, he's going to have to 
rejoin us here. Let me take uh, presenter control back. So we, we already have a number of great questions submitted to us. So we'll uh, make sure we ask those once uh, the talk is done. Oh, I'm all done. Oh, are you, are you, you all see? done? Oh, perfect. Yeah. Did I think, you? I think, did I think you we. I think we lost you like right before you you finished up. So I'm gonna I'm gonna actually if there was another last slide maybe I'll make you presenter again. Okay. Um, did you see the thank you slide or no? I, I did not. So oh, just, um, yeah. yeah, I think it was probably the next last slide. Oh yeah, there we go. Did you did you see this slide? Uh, did you, um, no, we didn't. I don't think we did. Let's see. For this Keep slide? Going. Yeah, we yeah we saw all these. We saw this guy with the with the scarred plexus. And, oh okay. Uh, Actually, yeah, and then we I'll, saw the one, we saw the one with, with one leg, uh, where one leg was treated, one leg wasn't. We definitely saw that one too. Okay, I, I would just, oh, here's the lecture. I don't know why this didn't like pop. This was the update. The cloud was the cloud was like not. I don't know why this was. No problem. The cloud was like not. <clears throat> Yeah, I was having some technical issues with the cloud. I mean, this was this was I I had done all these sort of uh, updates, but this was just the omentum. This was my fellow doing a deep flap while I harvested the omentum from the abdomen, and you can put this together. But the idea was uh, that I was talking about was immediate lymphatic reconstruction, um, and um, because this is like this is an axilla, even if there's e aside from the concern for lymphedema, um, is the pain and range of motion issues. So when those nerves are cut, they're bovey, they're clipped, and then there's this soft tissue defect, and now you have skin that's gonna get radiated and plastered to the nerves. It's a setup for pain and problems. So um, anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I'm bummed that I think I cut out. Uh, any, anyway, now I just put soft tissue in patients that are going to get radiated directly to the axilla and supraclavicular fossa and chest wall that are going to be having probably debilitating problems. I'll do yeah. that. And, um, you know, there were other things. These are the distal bypass, lymphovenous bypass. You can see scarred lymphatics, lymphatics, um, and, and hooking them up and actually having flow by being able to, uh, with imaging, uh, preoperatively using ICG, knowing that you're going to find a healthy lymphatic, and this is a patent lymphovenous bypass um, as well here. Um, this is immediate lymphatic reconstruction where I put an omentum at the time of the ax dissection and the mastectomy. I did a deep lap in omentum, and you can see her. She was radiated to the chest wall, the axilla, supraclavicular fossa, and the internal mammary chain, and she has you know, no cosmetic deformity, a nice supple axilla full of, full of omentum, and no lymphedema and full range of motion, no pain. Um, and this patient was really hit hard with radiation everywhere. So I think um, the final indications for doing any lymphatic procedure in our, in our, in our uh, institution is a BMI less than 30, no vein problems, uh, preoperative decongestive therapy, and realistic expectations. Um, and then I was just saying that I, I think the future cure will be a combination of surgery and medicine and that lymphatics are present throughout the body and um, may unlock the cure to other diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, cardiovascular diseases, and so forth. And just many, many thanks to my colleagues and mentors. That was it. Great. Well, thank you so much, Joe. That's a, really a thought-provoking lecture, and it really shows kind of your journey from you know, when you were a fellow in 08 to Changang and um, going from the lymph node flap in the groin where we didn't really know much and your journey to what you're using now, which is your mentor. Um, I have a few questions um, from my own and also from the audience. Um, I'm getting a lot of feedback. I'm not sure why. Um, 
Let's see here. Okay, so um, the questions are actually. Would you mind muting yourself while I ask the question? I think that may be one of the issues. I think we're getting okay. Good, perfect. Um, all right, great. So there were some questions about the the number of lift nodes in the omentum flap. Um, and how, mu how many nodes do you think you need for these operations? Um, so have you done studies to look at the, the average number of nodes that you're, that, you're, that you're getting? And do you really need the entire momentum or the approach that some folks in, Ch in Taiwan are doing where they're doing a small chunk of momentum? Is that, you think, sufficient? And so if you have any thoughts on that, it'd be great. Yeah, this, is, this has been a big question. It's a very good question. It's a question you've been asking for years and we don't really know the answer to. Um, I I do have the data. I haven't gone through all of it. Um, so we have post-op MRAs on every single patient we've done lymph node transplant on where the radiologist can actually, they count. Um, I have a great radiologist, so he will actually count the number of no, viable nodes in the flap. The omentum mole generally has small <laughs> nodes along that chain, so they're they're smaller than the resolution of MRI. They're not like, they're usually not like one, one and a half centimeter nodes. They're like three, four millimeter nodes and they're surrounded by fat. And so you don't really see them. Um, when you go more proximal, closer to the pancreas, you can see and feel like a, a bunch of grapes. But yeah. because of that first you know, early case, I, I'm, I'm more conservative now. So the omentum, you don't see them as discreetly as you do with the groin or axilla. You see the nodes are larger. Uh, we don't know. And actually, it seems like a simple enough question. But when you look at all the other degrees of freedom or variables, like the patient variables, uh, what stage lymphedema, whether you did this distal or proximal, um, where the nodes were taken from, um, fluid or fat dominant, um, and you go through all these variables, you actually need a very large number of patients that mm -hmm. really power the answer. Yep. And you need to be able to measure the outcome. The outcome measurement is still uh, really difficult. So. Mingwei did some basic science research on uh, uh, animal preclinical research showing that maybe more nodes is better. Um, but then you have Koshima saying that you don't even need nodes, you just need a little lymphatic vessel. This is the area right. where we need data. So I don't know. Yeah. I yeah, the other question, sorry. Basically, yeah. I feel the defect. Right, right. And the other question um, is, you know, and this is definitely, there's, kind of a more of a gist type question as opposed to science is do, do you think there's um, other characteristics of the flap besides just the number and size of nodes be it the, the pliability of it and the way it's, it's organized in a sheet versus a, a lump of fat that potentially makes the momentum a little bit better is there other, other qualities of the flap you think um again a great question i think the 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 key questions that have been raised are the direction of the lymphatic flow so in other words, like if you announce the most bowel in the wrong direction and the peristalsis is going the wrong way, it's not going to work. Is the same hold true for lymphatics? So does this have to have um, the proper orientation? Generally, when we're insetting the omentum, it does because more proximal, uh, the gastroepiploic chain along the pedicle is the direction of the lymphatic flow. Um, yeah. Whether you're yeah. orienting this like a string of pearls, David uh, Song uh, published, um, sort of just a straight line, like almost like a chain across the distal part of the omentum. here, the proximal part is here. You're not just sort of filling out the defect. I mean, that's one way to do it. I do feel that sometimes I have to get rid of that scar because some of these have a range of motion component. Um, and then, so I want to obliterate that defect. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I really don't know. Yep. I, I, yeah. I do think the physiology of your flap has to be good. You can't have venous hypertension, which is a potential problem with the omentum, not as much right. in the other flaps. Now, speaking of which, um, when you do when you split the omentum, um, which which I saw you do, and I forgot to ask you this question then, um, are you supercharging the hemiomentum as well? Or are you just doing the hemiomentum as a single info and envelope? Oh, no, I, so for the distal end, for the distal omentum, um, I usually bury it in the wrist, usually in the okay. ulnar, ulnar wrist, because it's hidden. Um, and I use it as a flow through. So I'll actually resect, you know, controversial. Right. A lot of people are like, you're crazy, that's horrible, you're doing the wrong thing. But the problem, like I'll resect a segment of 
ulnar artery and replace it with gastrocopoic artery. The reason I do that, and then hook up two veins. I hook up two veins. One's the superficial, one's the deep system. The reason I do that is because when you have such a small flap with the omentum and you're cutting off the end of the other side of the artery, you have like a very high pressure in a short distance. It's just going to slam into a dead end. Yeah. It's just yeah. not yeah. physiologic. Yeah. And I, I'm kind of de- uh, skeptical that having just this short piece of artery and such a high pressure, I, so that's why I do it. Um, Makes sense. Conceptually make more sense. Yeah. Now, um, the concept of immediate lymph node flaps, um, and I saw you do one um, when, I, when I was there. It's an interesting one. And the question is, um, has there been any work done on the oncologic considerations of putting in new nodes in a site where potentially there was cancer? Right. The only oncologic data I have is my own. We've done, um, I've done just over 400 lymph node transplants in the last 10 years. Um, the, I have not, to my knowledge, some patients go away. We track our patients fairly closely. Like I'm married to them for life and until they stop coming. Um, to my knowledge, I haven't seen any recurrence in the node flap, which is actually an interesting observation. You would expect, particularly in a patient with a high risk of recurrence, these are all stage three and above pretty much. Um, yeah. They've all been radiated. They've all had chemo or the vast majority. Uh, some of these would develop, you know, recurrence. I have had a patient I transferred omentum in who had some kind of, um, I forget the type of tumor it was. And we found uh, it's a slow growing indolent tumor. And we actually found incidentally tumor in the omentum post-op on pathology. I always send a portion of omentum. Mm-hmm. I don't do omentum transfers in patients with ovarian cancer because of the potential for peritoneal seeding. I kind of avoid that. There could be a cold mm-hmm. tumor or whatever. Um, yeah. But you do have to be careful. And even in peripheral lymph node transplant, uh, physical exam, I always check for adenopathy and mass. But if you do enough of these, one day sooner or later, you might be transplanting a node with a cold disease to another place. Uh, it's definitely entered my mind in the very beginning. I, I don't, um, I have not observed any increased oncologic risk. Actually, if anything, quite the opposite. Um, although it's not, it's not, um, we are, we have the data, but for that kind of thing, for oncologic risk, you need to look five, 10 years, yeah. you know, out. Yeah. We don't have honestly high level data, but we will in another, you know, three, five years. Right. But there's no, um, there's no pushback from the on- oncologic surgeons just from a conceptual standpoint is, is, is what you're saying. No, there was never any pushback. I work closely with them. Um, we we presented great. each other's conferences. Um, That's great. Great. Um, um, another couple of questions, and then we have um, one from one of our fellows as well. You mentioned that the BMI of kind of less than 30 is one of your criteria. Um, do you, have you ever had any patients who, whom you recommended bariatric surgery in, in preparation for this, or is it just kind of a strict cutoff? Yeah, no, I think um, it's hard because if, if you get sort of identified as the lymphedema person, then anybody with swelling will come to you and a lot of, and then you're letting down a lot of people. Um, and it's not good for you or the patient. So historically, when I first started, I would just see everybody. I just wanted to help everybody, help the world, learn the disease. Yeah. I, I just, and the problem is, is that people have hope. Even if you tell them up front, listen, you're probably not a candidate. You're definitely not a candidate. If they're coming to see you, they're coming to see you because there's one in a million something that they're hoping and then you're going to spend an hour with somebody crying uh, and then getting angry, uh, may voice that online. Um, you've wasted their time. You've wasted taken them away from work. You've, you've lifted their hope up unwittingly and then, you know, hit them over the head. So I just don't think I've been really, I don't think that's a service to patients. The reason why we have a BMI cutoff and I, we do and have recommended bariatric surgery, some of our patients actually have gone through that or have lost weight naturally, and then we've gone on to do lymphatic surgery. I educate the patient that the higher BMI will impair the lymphatic system. There's plenty of data on that. And when you're dealing in an area where you may do a surgery that not only might not work, but actually might make somebody worse, the the safety and quality control has to be as good as you possibly can have. And so um, 
also if you're answering a question scientifically if you're just i had a, like a nissen fundoplication for severe GERD like in my chief year of residency and before i got it i knew i needed it it was like i couldn't eat i was losing weight it was bad i was getting pneumonia i i read the literature and the literature looked like it like worked some of the time there were some bad complications i went to the surgeon and he said yeah the literature is terrible because the problem is the surgeons were just doing this on anybody with heartburn everybody not not with bad intention they wanted to help but there were no clear indications and therefore the results were all over the place including some bad complications yeah. uh, that left an impression in me now it fixed my GERD but I was properly selected I had the manometry I had this and that it was like purely mechanical issue mm -hmm. so I really <clears throat> I think um I think patient populations are different so there are places in the Midwest for example where you're rarely going to see a patient with a BMI of less than 30 and it may make sense you tailor your uh indications to your, to your patient population what is reasonably safe for me um i just want to answer is what i'm doing working and for that i need a more homogeneous patient group if i right. operate on everybody i might conclude that it doesn't work but actually it does work it's just in patients with a with a, a particular set of criteria yeah great um now we do have a question from one of our fellows danny balkan danny are you there yeah, thank you so much. What a phenomenal talk. Um, my oh, question thank is, you. I'm is, glad you didn't fall asleep. Oh, no, not, not, not even close. Um, quick question for you. And it's more of a, of a conceptual question. In the, in the abdomen with the omentum in situ, is the lymphatic drainage around the peripancreatic and gastroepiploic region, is it, is it draining out through the venous channels of the lymphatic uh, I'm sorry, of the omentum itself, or is it draining through lymphatic channels that are in the abdomen themselves? The reason I ask is because when you transplant it, you're, have, you're obviously counting on some lymphatical venous connections in the omentum itself. And I'm wondering right. if that's what takes time to develop or whether that just maybe doesn't exist as well in some patients. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, in, in the abdomen, in situ, the, the lymphatic drainage and intra-abdominally is going to ultimately go to the thoracic duct and then up um, right at the right in your supraclavicular mm -hmm. fossa where it's going to empty at the base of the, um, the uh, IJ and, this, and the, su su um, the uh, subclavian vein. Um, when you take this out, the idea is is that at the level of the lymph node there are interconnections between the lymphatic sinuses and the venules we know that anatomically in fact that's how you know lymph nodes themselves are where antigen get presented and then mm -hmm. memory cell your immune system builds up memory cells and so forth that interaction and those cells go back those immune cells have to go out of the lymph node out of the lymphatic system essentially out of where the antigen was delivered into the venous circulation and and so we know those connections exist, both on just physiologically and on electromicroscopy and so forth. Um, the question is, is that actually the mechanism of the lymph node transplant? Mingwei did some uh, in vivo studies that showed some, some, some fairly convincing evidence, not 100%, but some evidence that that was actually working. He took three flaps that had no lymph nodes, bathed them after anastomosis in a ICG and albumin mix, and then a lymph node transplant that was also hooked up after anastomosis and bathed them. And there was, um, clear, there was clearly a difference in uh, ICG flowing out of the lymph node flap out of the venous anastomosis and not out of the, um, the uh, non-lymph node it's flap. Only. It's not 100, it's not black and white uh, like many things, but, but it's, that mechanism is, uh, it's, it's, in t it's a possible mechanism. The other mechanism is when you're going proximal in the axilla, that this is just simply a bridge, that it's just bridging and restoring continuity of the lymphatic defect. Um, I think that I have seen that very first case was the distal lymph node transplant, and the only way that can work is if they're shunting from the lymphatic system into the venous system at the level of the lymph node. There is no bridge there. Um, so just deductively, I think that's probably uh, the mechanism why it works in some cases and doesn't in others, I really, I'm really at a loss. 
Um, thank you, Joe. And I have one last question before we before we let let you go. Um, so obviously there are different approaches as far as where you place these flaps. And um, you know, for example, Dave uh, typically places it in, in, the, in the axilla, Ming Wei usually prefers the wrist area. Um, and and you do both. I mean, I've seen you do both axilla and wrist. And tell us about the thought process of of, of which patient you use the axilla, and and then how bad the hand needs to be tried to, be, to potentially split and do both. Well, there's a rationale. There's no, again, no, no like data. So in the beginning, I was just trying to figure out this procedure and figure out like what definitely didn't work, what may work, what did definitely did work. So the rationale is this, is that if I do on pre-op ICG and there's stardust all over, there's no lymphatics, mm -hmm. there's no nothing. And there's actually nothing leaving above the elbow after a half hour, an hour. I'm worried that if I just put lymph nodes up here, it'll probably take like a week for it to see any lymph. And um, <clears throat> and I, that's the rationale for putting uh, lymph nodes down there. I see like lymphocentigraphy, there's no drainage above here. ICG, there's nothing that goes above the elbow. I, I then put something distally. Whether that's right or wrong, time will tell. Um, if they have axillary contracture or pain, for me, that's a hard indication for proximal lymph node transplant because at very minimum, you have a shot at improving their quality of life because of the morbidity of the ax dissection itself, excluding the lymphedema. Um, so that's how I approach it. If they have both, uh, then I'll do both. Um, Got it. And Got it. basically that's it. Uh, it's a, it, it, it does make intuitive sense. Um, so I, I definitely see your point. Well, Joe, thank you so much. Um, it's been an incredible honor to have you and, and to have you share your, your journey over the last uh, decade plus with lymphatic surgery. Uh, Greg, did you have a comment before I, I, before I say your mic's off? Thank you very much, Joe. That was fantastic. Thank you, Greg. Yeah. Yeah, it's been really an honor and a pleasure to have you and, and, and obviously to, to um, get to know you on a, on a personal level as well. And, and, and we, we hope to hopefully see you in person soon um, with all this co coronavirus stuff slowing down, hopefully. I, I hope so, too. I, I miss seeing everybody. And it's truly an honor and, um, and a pleasure. And um, thank you so, so much, Greg and Bavik and everybody. I uh, wish everybody good health and safety. Great. And uh, I hope so to much. see you sooner than later. Yeah, and and say hi to everyone at uh, at Sloan Kettering for us. Okay. I will. I will. Alrighty. Thanks, well. everyone. Take care. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.